All right, now that the dust has settled, it hasn't settled yet, has it? Great. Well, I have not yet earned my PokeTuber shield dollars, so I gotta get in here and defend Game Freak for a bit. Wait! Is Loxton going to defend them? Hasn't he always been super critical of Game Freak since way before this controversy? What in tarnation? Why yes, I am normally. Thanks for noticing. This is gonna be one of those lay intellectual centrist videos where obviously I'm the superior one. Where ultimately I just upset everyone on both sides. Uh, so yeah. There's gonna be a lot of Devil's Advocate stuff in here because I'm more interested in why people think the way they do rather than the actual thing. Or another way of putting it is I prefer understanding the logic and desires behind the argument rather than the actual subject matter of said argument. So I'm gonna be saying things I don't necessarily agree with for the sake of a logic trail and understanding all of the nuance of the situation which unfortunately is a little hard for some people to understand, so I hope you in particular are awesome. Also, jokes will be in here, if you could call them that. Also, odds are, considering my luck, I'm going to get something wrong in this, so. Quality reporting. Anyway, there are 2.43 million videos on this already, pointing to things like the T-posing Wingle and that dumb tree, and comparing modern Pokemon to old Pokemon games like Battle Revolution and Stadium. Which honestly, isn't a fair comparison. I mean, this game is like 64 years old, but it wasn't made by Game Freak. You honestly think Game Freak will ever be capable of something like this? So while I will be going into the whole Game Freak debate thing that's splitting the community, I'm more interested in the community goings-ons, and it's gotten way out of hand. You need to be 13 to have a Twitter account, all right? Don't ask questions, just consume product and be excited for the next product. <laughs> this meme rebuttal is being used incredibly improperly, as is the word entitled. But it's also just as good of an argument as, shh, just let people enjoy things. They are two sides of the same buttered coin. And too many people are latching on to all the wrong things and getting kind of, for lack of a better word, dumb about it. Poor Joe of Serebii, I think he's handled this decently well, but people keep hating on him for constantly defending Game Freak by stopping the spread of misinformation. You realize how stupid that sounds, right? Hey, I found out recently that Genghis Khan once smoked an entire bouquet of kittens. What a terrible man. Actually, that's not true. It's misinformation. Oh, God! Are you defending that terrible person? Are you a genocidal maniac? Uh, no, I just don't want misinformation to spread. This guy is literally as bad as him, the Mongolian shill. <laughs> don't ask questions. Just be excited for more murder, am I right? Is this why politics is getting so bad and divisive? Because it's the same kind of mindset, but with things that actually matter. And then there's the hashtag don't bring back national decks, people. As in you actually want less content? Or are you just being petty? This whole situation is stupid. The only thing worse than whining about a kid's game is whining about the whiners. And then whining about the whiners, whining about the whiners is even worse. It's a never-ending loop, which ultimately comes down to my most important innermost philosophy on life. Shut up. The less you get involved and say things, the less pain you feel. Honestly though, I just really want to talk about this for the sake of talking about this because I guess I'm a PokeTuber and I need to capitalize on it. Mainly though, I wanted to further understand and break down the arguments of people on both sides, the most common ones they keep bringing up, because there is still a lot of misinformation being spread and also illogical things going on, and yes, even two logical things going on. It's just a mess. I don't want to specify, but if you're into this whole debacle, then you're probably going to know what I'm talking about. There's a load of videos by a few people that are using Battle Revolution footage and unlogically destroying comments from Game Freak defenders, using, of course, logic and reason of the utmost degree. But to assume logic is the only thing at play is faulty in and of itself, because humans are not logical. We'd be a utopia by now if that were the case. You've got to realize that emotions do play a role, thus this whole thing being incredibly nuanced. You can't just apply a big chunk of logic onto something and consider the argument destroyed. And to assume that you can is, well, it's very pseudo-intellectual. 
you're at this point on the chart of life. Anyway, I guess I should mention my biases. Everybody plays Pokemon differently, and personally, I have only transferred Pokemon to another game once. And I felt kind of cheaty about it. Even recently in Pokemon Let's Go, I got that special Mew for the Pokeball controller, and I put Mew into the game from the beginning, and I felt mildly scummy for it. I don't know exactly why, it just feels like I didn't earn it, I guess. Anyway, what I'm getting at is that the dex cut does not affect me, so I personally don't care that much about it. But that's not to say I'm completely opinionless on the matter. Hopefully, since they don't need to work so much on improving all of the Pokémon, they can put that effort towards something else, right? And of course, it sucks when something gets removed. I still miss seasons and triple battles and the battle frontier as much as the next guy. And I'm fine with things like Z-moves and Dynamax leaving in the future generations though. You gotta give the gens at least one thing that makes them unique. Plus, story-wise, Z-moves are an Alola-only thing, and it's already been stated that Dynamaxing is exclusive to the Galar region. And even the dex cut I accepted almost immediately. Honestly, I accepted it years ago because it's inevitable. Making the whole Thanos snap comparison even better. It's Pokemon Generation 20! Here's Pokemon number 2035! You ready to play as the same six Pokemon for the 45th time? There's also only like 80 Pokemon that are competitively viable. Basically every other creature capture-esque game has already had to do this already. Nobody really complained then. Digimon Cyber Sleuth only had 240 Digimon in it, despite there being over 800 Digimon. Yokai Watch 3 has 690 befriendable yokai, and Yokai Watch 4 is stated to have significantly less. But at least they've said they will add the rest in patches. And while we're bringing up other games, many people keep looking at the recent Dragon Quest game and saying it's what Pokemon should look like. Or Nino Kuni. Or Persona. Or the Tales series. Or any other modern JRPG. But, 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 when someone brings that up, the point does come up that these franchises have copy-paste monsters, where these each count as different monsters despite just being recolors. Okay, so we can take the numbers of monsters that they have, be pessimistic about it, and cut it to between a third and a half or so, and so this is the real number. God. While I'm totally fine with the cut of Pokemon, I sure hope there are more than that. Especially considering that these games are significantly lower income. Which brings us to that recent Chinese knockoff that recently popped up. People keep looking at it as proof that such a thing is possible. That thing being a modern Pokemon game with actually expressive Pokemon battles, and Blastoise's water coming out of its cannons instead of its forehead, and Charizard's fire coming out of its mouth instead of 10 feet up to the right of its head in the recent trailer. God, don't show that in the middle of this controversy! But the counter argument to this is always, but there are only 60 Pokemon in this Chinese knockoff, and this game is just battling, and they have a very limited pool of moves, which is all true. But that doesn't make the fact that it looks better untrue. Plus, the main argument here stems from the previous counter-argument that quality animations take too long, therefore, we don't want quality animations, I guess. But these are quality animations, and they don't take too long. That's the only point realistically being made here. People aren't saying we need every Pokémon to have a unique animation for every attack, but maybe they could have a quick unique attack like this? That would be nice. Maybe having a Pokémon do more than stand in place and fly and tip around like this. <sighs> like if it just moved its legs mildly, that'd be better. Maybe we could have more dynamic camera shots and the Pokémon's expression and poses could be more dynamic and expressive instead of looking demotivated and like they're all bored. Except for Ludicolo. Ludicolo's good. This should be the uh, bare minimum standard. But also, that's not to say there are no new good animations for attacks in Sword and Shield, because there are a few that they've shown off. I mean, of course there is. Everybody's cherry picking. There's cherry picking going all over the place on both sides of the table. I mean, compare these moves. Clearly, one is significantly better than the other, so each side picks that one to show off all the time. But then I don't like how the defenders all say, well, that's a move that will be deleted eventually. No real Pokemon's gonna keep it. As if that's some sort of defense. Like, yeah, it's stinking double kick, a super basic early game move, but shouldn't your first impressions with a new game or a new Pokemon be a good first impression? 
Wouldn't that be great for branding? Couldn't they, at the very least, have the user do their basic attack animation while bouncing, or make a face, or something, instead of just their idle stance bouncing two inches? But back to the other side of the argument, yeah, a lot of these animations do look great for Pokemon. So I agree there, this is the best animated Pokemon game to date, if you ignore Gen 5. This all reminds me of a wingle that an animation student made in under 24 hours. Yeah, it didn't look the best, but it was still more realistic or at least believable and more expressive than this. Ah! And then you have people defending this wingle, like the heck. Which honestly, honestly, this is the stupidest thing in the whole video. So this, this is the peak. It's all downhill from here, let me tell ya. So Wingle's Pokedex entries mention that it doesn't need to flap its wings because it uses updrafts or something. AKA, yeah, I agree, this animation does look like crap. But you see, that's because it's supposed to. So ha, huh, your criticism is invalid. Yeah, no, firstly, explaining Pokemon science, lore, and inspiration stuff is my expertise. It's what this whole channel basically is now. And the Pokedex has been wrong several times before. After all, Wingle still flaps its wings plenty in the anime and several battle animations. The reason it says this about Wingle is because it's a seagull, and it's also partially inspired by the Albatross, which happens to be famous for exactly the same thing. The Albatross is able to fly without flapping its wings for miles upon miles upon miles because it uses ocean and cliff up drafts. Seagulls can do the same to a lesser extent. So Wingle, being a little seagull Pokemon, yeah, it can do the same. When it has those updrafts, why don't you show me a single albatross T-posing two feet off the ground, hovering and turning in place like a helicopter with no ocean in sight? I can't believe I'm explaining a freaking Wingle, but I feel like these animations aren't even the main thing a lot of people are upset about. Pokemon, since X and Y, has never looked the best. Pokemon fans are used to that. Game Freak has already been using these animations and models for almost a decade, and we've all been relatively fine with it, so clearly that's not the main issue here. What is, though, seems to be just that better animations was the reasoning behind the Dex Purge. When we still have almost entirely reused animations, and Pokemon popping up from the ground suddenly, and this. It's just a demo. Well, yeah, it is. And we've already seen various improvements since the earlier trailers. So yeah, it is just a demo right now. But as of now, who truly knows how much better it's going to get? But the thing is, trailers are supposed to sell a game, and all these have done is divide the community, meaning the trailers failed at their job. And I mean, they're even reusing the human animations, so what are they even improving? Well, I'll show you, haters. Look at this scenery! It's easily the prettiest Pokemon has ever been! Sure, it's no Mario Odyssey, or Xenoblade, or Zelda, or Monster Hunter, or Dragon Quest, or Tails, or Nino Kuni, or Yokai. Well, I'm getting sidetracked. You can't deny that this isn't pretty, and the distant objects and blurry textures are always the last bit of polish that games get. So just be a bit more patient, and we'll see how things go. And while some human animations are reused, mainly the generic emotes, most of the other animations they've been showing off are not only fresh, but they look great! These are easily the best looking humans Pokemon has ever had. They are extremely expressive and detailed, the designs are great too. So maybe this is what Game Freak meant. Not just Pokemon animations, but all the animations, the people, the environment, the starters are likely going to have a ton of extra scenes, and who knows how detailed Pokemon Refresh is going to be this time around. Speaking of which, I always wondered why the Pokemon have sleeping animations in Refresh, but in battles they just close their eyes. Hmm. But speaking of the environment, many points to the Nintendo 64 quality tree, and boulders, and mountains, and draw distance, and which yeah, is pretty bad, but like I said, this is when it's just a demo comes up as a legitimate point. These are the kinds of things that we've already started to see getting improved from trailer to trailer. So I'll give that a pass for now. Also, N64 quality is a bit mean, it's easily GameCube. But don't get me wrong, despite what I probably sound like right now, I'm no hater, because I personally think these games do look great to play. Not necessarily graphically, but they don't need to be. It's never been about the graphics, at least not entirely. Though, a nice AAA looking Pokemon game would be nice, that's never been the main reason to play Pokemon now, is it? 
mean, clearly. That being said, I feel like this whole thing isn't due solely to the national decks and animation quality debacle. I think this has been building for some time. While I've mainly kept it quiet, because who the heck would want to be loud about this, I do occasionally browse various Pokemon subreddits and Pokemon Amino, Serebii, and a load of Pokemon-related Twitter accounts and even 4chan's Pokemon board, because I'm interested in the goings-on of the community. And let me tell you, this has been building for generations. Any game with as broad of an appeal and popularity as Pokemon is going to have a load of full-on haters for no reason. So there's always going to be that, and there's always been that. But over the years, it's grown slowly. Heart Gold and Soul Silver are still often credited as being the best Pokemon games of all time. Black and White 2 are up there also. Sure, they were missing some previous innovations and things people loved, like the Battle Frontier, but they made up for it by adding even better things. Heart Gold has every Pokemon follow you now. That's a lot of sprite work. Plus, it's a remake of a fan favorite. But then they got rid of that in black and white and their sequels. But uh, at least those added triple battles. It is the best written and most interesting story Pokemon has had to date. It has seasons. And the biggest thing, the animated Pokemon sprites. Hot dang. These are incredible and so expressive. How does the DS even handle this? It pushed the system to the limits. Sure, loads of people were upset that you couldn't catch any of the previous gen Pokemon in the first one until post-game, which is also why I think its sequel is better, but overall, it was a massive improvement. And then came Pokemon X and Y, which, uh, was not. Sure, it moved the franchise to 3D, but at what cost? Your avatar spacing out with a creepy smile and Pokemon that look bored inside instead of like they're fighting? It's not a bad game by any means, I still thoroughly enjoyed it, but it was unimpressive to most. But if we learned one thing 20 years ago in the 90s, it was that the move to 3D is an awkward time, so they'll improve it in the next game. Besides, a few Pokemon got Megas, and now you can pet and feed your Pokemon too. That's really cool. Oh neat! A remake of Gen 3, and with Megas! And graphically, it is a lot cleaner than X and Y, even if the Mons still look a little brain dead. But, uh, I'm excited to be able to play the Battle Frontier again- But here comes Sun and Moon. It looks even cleaner. Nice. Z-moves are just anime trash, but at least it's something. Oh. No new Megas? Nah, that's fine. I'll even accept the Kanto Pandra, I mean Alolan Pokemon. Alolan forms, that's actually a super cool idea, and I sure hope every Pokemon game from now on expands on it. So, I suppose that more than makes up for the story and the small islands. Though I do think I'd rather watch the anime at this point, I can't press the A button fast enough. But it's fine, it's fine. It's still a great game, just not as, as great. The humans are more expressive, the Ultra Beasts are... Well, I thought they were really neat, but a lot of people didn't. And sure, they didn't add any more Megas, but at least they let them in. And the story is pretty clear that Z-moves are an Alolan thing, so I've already accepted that Z-moves will not come back next time. That's fine. And then Usum happened. But now the Nintendo Switch. Game Freak has no choice now but to finally give me my console quality Pokemon game. Finally! I've literally been waiting for this my entire life. My whole life's moments have been just building into this one. This is what I've been wanting since Red and Blue. Man, all these Switch games coming out are amazing. Breath of the Wild reinvented Zelda. Mario Odyssey reinvented Mario. I can't wait for them to finally reinvent Pokemon in some way. Let's go Pikachu and Eevee. All right. Well, that's, that's totally acceptable, I suppose. It's a Gen 1 remake for a new generation of kids. Pokemon Go did bring in a lot more new fans, so I understand. I understand why it doesn't have all the Pokemon, but hey, just like Mario and Zelda, they made a drastic change to the formula. There's overworld Pokemon, Pokemon follow you again, and uh, the, the Pokemon Go catch wild Pokemon system. I'm not super big on that, but I understand. Cool. Great. This is fine. Played the game. It was good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, and come to think of it, this being a new super easy casual Pokemon game means that the next generation... <gasps> they can finally make a Pokemon game for the more experienced fans! Finally! 
d difficulty settings, or a more intense story, or something. Let's all overhype ourselves with ideas, speculation, and fan art. We are ready. We're finally ready to have a real, intense, open world, triple A, console quality Pokemon adventure with an actual budget. Uh, hey, Game Freak here. Here's a Y2K quality pre-rendered trailer. The gameplay is basically the same. Following Pokemon are gone, and while the resolution is higher, the draw distance and texture quality points to our handheld console roots because making games is hard. Please understand. Oh, also there's no Megas or Z-moves. There's also no draw distance at all, and Pokemon just pop into existence up close, which looks really awkward. Also, there's no hint or talk of a difficulty setting, Galarian forms, seasons, an actual open world experience as opposed to a glorified safari zone. So, uh, I hope you like it. We're reusing not all, but a lot of the same animations that we have since like six years ago. Our franchise makes more than Marvel, but making games is hard work. So, uh, we're Thanos snapping the game with, uh, gotta catch them all catchphrases. Bye. And you expect people to not be upset? That's somehow even dumber than being this upset about it. I feel like a lot of the Defenders are seeing this as a knee-jerk reaction to the one announcement, which I'm sure for some people it is. I mean, they can't play as Jinx anymore, so what's the point? But for most attackers, it's not a knee-jerk reaction. It's the straw that broke the Numel's back. Though I guess in this case it's more drastic. It's the boulder that freaking crushed and destroyed the very being of an already overloaded Numel. And now we have all this talk of entitlement, which is... it feels like a misnomer. Is that the right word? A fallacy? It's like instead of arguing about the subject at hand, we're arguing about the people's attitudes about the subject. I mean, yeah, obviously, you are not entitled to a Pokemon game of the quality you seek, which is why you can easily just not buy it. It's literally the easiest thing to do. Not do something. I skipped Ultra Moon despite my career revolving around Pokemon. Like, come on. I just watched Let's Plays and had others tell me about it instead. But yeah, you aren't entitled to that. So stop acting like it. That being said, to the other side of the table, people are entitled to voice their opinions and criticisms. And know that criticism does not necessarily equal hate. It is perfectly okay to be peeved at Game Freak for doing this. People were already upset that it seemed like the new gimmicks were flavors of the week rather than anything long-lasting or substantial or if they mean anything at all. And now that they are removed outright, that's solid proof of it. And replaced with what? Big boys. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like how any Pokemon can do this. It's better for overall balance than Megas were, but then again, Gigantamaxing and Raid Battle Mons seem to remove any of that balance. So uh, maybe that's not a thing. But admittedly, Admittedly, this is pretty funny. It just gets bigger has been a joke in the Pokemon community for over a decade. Used to poke fun at Pokemon or fake Mon with lame evolutions that don't add anything. They just get bigger. And now we're removing two flashy, interesting gimmicks with literally, it just gets bigger. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, people. So obviously, people are going to be upset. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in. And of course, of course, absolutely, the hate went way too far and out of proportion. Hashtagging everything related to Pokemon or its developers with Bring Back National decks, including wedding pictures. You people suck. And then that one guy making a fake account to make false rape accusations? Mega suck. Should be an arrestable offense. Though, I'm not going to pin that on the Bring Back National decks side of the community as a whole because that's dumb! Why would you do that? It's one bad apple. Like, do you remember the guy who murdered people over a nerf to his favorite gun in Call of Duty? Is that to say the entire Call of Duty fandom is literal human trash? Nah. You cannot look at the actions of an individual and judge a whole group. That's literally the definition of those race, class, sex, gender, able-isms that we're always talking about. So what would this be? Fandomism? Fandism? It's like me saying Undertale fans are all mentally ill because there are a few vocal ones that are. That's rude. And fandomism. Don't do that. Having hype and expectations is not entitlement just as much as stopping the spread of misinformation and real hate isn't shilling. 
The stars were finally aligned. Now is the time for Game Freak to finally prove their worth, their first console quality game, during a time when Nintendo keeps switching up all of their big franchises, during a time right after they got a stupid amount of money for Pokemon Go hype and merch. It's all coming in. Surely, surely they would do something that makes the extra $20 that they're charging for this game worth it. A lot of people overhyped themselves. They were getting tired of Game Freak's supposed lazy antics, and saw this as an opportunity for them to redeem themselves. The Pokemon community was at its largest, so speculation and ideas ran rampant, and expectations got way too high. Now, I've said this for years, as much as I completely adore Pokemon, do you really think Game Freak is capable of making those expectations reality? Even though, until now, every Pokemon game not made by Game Freak looks more graphically impressive and expressive, and sometimes is even written better, or actually does something interesting with the gameplay mechanics. I mean, until now, Game Freak has only really been into handheld games. The power of, from that to a console is a big jump. And it's not like they can afford to hire on more experienced help. They are just the most valued franchise in the entire world. But, but, that's misleading. This is another argument that gets thrown around a lot. Pokemon is the biggest franchise in the world. It makes more money than Star Wars, Mickey Mouse, Marvel, Mario, etc, etc. So clearly they can afford to just hire more people to help. But, you know, most of that money doesn't go to Game Freak, right? Most of it goes to merchandising. I mean, look at this shelf behind me. It's disgusting. Pokemon may be valued at 90 billion dollarinos, but 61 of those billions is from merch. The video games, spin-offs included, are worth 17 billion dollars. I mean, Pokemon X and Y only grossed 640 million dollars. You expect them to turn around and make that into a high-budget game? I mean, sure, your Final Fantasies, your Red Deads, your Call of Duties, they keep throwing around like 140 million, 240 million dollar budgets, so it would make sense then to have their games be big budget too then, right? So uh, what budget do they give themselves? An estimated, because there are no official numbers released, an estimated 20 million. Hmm. Hmm, indeed. I mean, who am I? They can spend their money however they want. But, you know, that means they have, like, one of the highest profit margins of any video game ever, because they spend significantly less on production. Like, look at this difference. They spend significantly less on production, yet make significantly more than the rest. Only thing I can think of that may have a better turnaround is Minecraft or something. One of those tiny budget indie games that just explode in popularity. So this time, I think the attackers got it right. They say it's the biggest revenue generating franchise in the world. Then the defenders say, oh, but you are a fool. Most of that money comes from merchandise, not the games. Game Freak doesn't see most of that money. Which is true, they don't see most of that money. But that doesn't mean they can't easily afford to break the record for the most expensive video game budget of all time and still make a profit guaranteed. Which really puts the whole franchise into perspective. Like, gosh dang, that's a lot of money. But money is just one thing. What about time? When the attackers say Game Freak should just work harder, longer hours, and get the game out on time, and have all the mods, that's where I really draw the line, because that's actual entitlement. Your enjoyment of a game is more important than the developer's work-life balance and all? Don't be selfish. And unfortunately, Game Freak can't exactly delay a game, because then everything gets put on hold. New merch, new anime, new trading cards, they are already under a ton of pressure to get this done now. But considering how much money these mainline games make already, they could easily hire on more help, right? Game Freak has 143 employees. Not necessarily game developers, employees. And they do outsource some additional work. For instance, X and Y and Sun and Moon did commission a lot of external work for 3D modeling from Creatures Inc. And altogether, they had a team of a little over 500. But again, that's including translators, localizers, managers, 
you know, everything. The guy that went and got coffee. Maybe 500 plus seems like a lot. I mean, try managing that many people with such a sizable budget. Really, I feel like there's basically no excuse here. Sure, it's a lot of work to do all these animations for 1,000 plus Pokemon, but get this. How about, in my armchair developer status, how about you temporarily hire 1,000 animators, assign each one a single Pokemon for a month? They don't even have to come into the office. Commission freelancers, external help, game dev teams do this all the time, including Game Freak already. I mean, if this student can model and animate this Wingle in 24 hours, imagine what a fully trained career animator with a pre-existing model can do in a month, right? But maybe a thousand people sounds ridiculous. Well, maybe not. BioWare has 800. Well, maybe not anymore after their recent mess. <clears throat> Blizzard and Ubisoft Montreal have 2,700 people on their dev teams each. Of course, they are usually working on a few games at a time, but Game Freak is doing the same thing, working on their other game, Town. And they are usually working on a few Pokemon games at a time. For instance, Black and White 2 and X and Y were developed at the same time. Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun were also likely the same. And they have been releasing smaller games throughout all this time too. But we're not done. Capcom hired 600 people to make Resident Evil 6. Freaking Epic Mickey 2 had a team of 700. And these aren't temp workers. It's THE development teams. Though of course, obviously they aren't all animators. But you at least gotta see the point I'm trying to make here. Game Freak overloaded themselves. In the same amount of time they usually have to make a handheld game, now they have to make an HD one. And they, as far as we know as of now, didn't expand themselves or do anything to help with that. This whole Pokemon calling then had to either be planned from the start, or Game Freak really is just that unaware or inexperienced with console game development. They may have thought they could do it all, but with the immovable object that is the deadline, they had to do something now suffer this unstoppable force of a rabid fan base. It's split into attackers and defenders. Sword and shield, unstoppable force versus an unmovable object. They are geniuses! They planned this out! It all comes to- Could you imagine if Game Freak worked with the dev team that made Pokemon Battle Revolution? The argument used is that Battle Revolution had actually expressive animations because the game was nothing but battling. But that argument is assuming that these games always have to be one or the other. They don't have to be one or the other. We already talked about the game budget thing. Now imagine if we just rose that budget 50%, 30 million instead of 20 million, which is still nothing compared to the most high selling games. With this extra budget, Game Freak can outsource to Genius Sonority, the Battle Revolution dev team, to just exclusively make battle animations. Similar to how Game Freak already outsources Pokemon modeling to Creatures Inc. With this, in the grand scheme of things, small budgeting tweak, you can easily have your typical Pokemon game overworld and plot and battles that look fun and expressive. It's really not that hard to conceptualize. Which is why many people did conceptualize it, which got us into the overhyped thing again. There are several reasons people had such high expectations in Game Freak's first big console Pokemon game, and they were let down. Though, of course, that's no excuse to be a sourpuss pessimist jerkwad, but then again, people being sourpusses is no excuse to start kissing the boots and emotionally investing yourself in defending a company that doesn't really care about your wants. If you aren't going to buy the game, there's two other kids who are going to get it for their first Pokemon game. There's nothing anyone can really do. So maybe you're gonna buy the game anyway, and enjoy it. I am too! I love Pokemon. But I will always say that I want it to get the Sonic Mania treatment. I'd rather the Pokemon Company and Nintendo would get a different developer for it. Let Game Freak do the spin-offs. Or perhaps just the design and lore, because they're great at that. But then get a team that understands animation, graphical prowess, and basic optimizational programming to do most of the work from the main games. Oh, you don't know about that? In summary, Game Freak does not understand how to organize files, I guess. For example, instead of having a single Lily model in Sun and Moon that the game loads when she's present, like almost literally every other video game out there, every single map file has her. And it's not just her. 
this is just one example of hundreds. There's loads of copies of the same model everywhere because they don't know how to just say, load this model. Instead, they have to say, hey, every single map has this model in it, grab that when you're in this map. There's, there's loads of repeated files wasting so much space on the cart and increasing load times needlessly. There's also several parts where the game loads and unloads, encrypts and de-encrypts constantly several hundreds of times, I might be exaggerating, but constantly a lot. They don't know how to properly program or optimize besides brute forcing things. So right now, as I'm making my notes, I'm voicing this now, but right when I was making my notes, a month-old Famitsu article started making the rounds again. A Reddit post translated it as, Game Freak had to remake all of the Pokemon models from scratch. And so, loads of defenders are latching onto that and spreading it around against the argument that Game Freak is lazy. But here's the thing, Japanese to English is complicated, which is why this translation itself is being called into question, and there's loads of other translators on the internet trying to clarify this and stop the spread of misinformation. But you know how it is. It's not the first bit of information I read! So everything else is wrong! First of all, Game Freak doesn't even make the models of the Pokémon. Secondly, if they had to remake them, why would they remake them literally identically? This would have been the perfect opportunity to make them even the tiniest bit more expressive. A lot of people know that when all the models were made in X and Y, they were future-proofed. They were made with way more polygons than they would need for a long time. And just by looking at Gen 7 versus Gen 8, you can use your eyes to see that even the textures are mostly the same. The only thing different is the lighting engine. That's about it. These are X and Y models, but without the downscaling. Or who knows, they might even still be downscaled a little. They might have future-proofed that much. I'm just an armchair developer, obviously, but I did do a lot of brawl hacking in my youth, and Josh, the main behind-the-scenes guy, does do a bit, a bit of 3D model work for 3D printing. And there's no amount of coding difference that would make transferring these models impossible. Because 3D models aren't programming, they are points in space. Converting file types of 3D models is extremely basic stuff. Maybe, just maybe, they still had to go over every model and copy-paste the polygons into a new program, which is extremely basic, but would technically be from scratch. But anyone with non-delusioned eyes can see that this exact point isn't 100% correct, especially since Game Freak doesn't have much to do with the models themselves. This is being spread as misinformation. Especially considering they never specified how many models they had to redo. And again, we can just look at them compared to the old models to see most of what we've seen so far. It, it, it hasn't updated at all. Plus, I mean, for instance, the same translated article says that Game Freak split their team in half in order to work on Pokemon and Town at the same time. Game Freak isn't that dumb, guys. They likely meant split in two, not half, because they've always had a small side team working on new ideas. But they did mention that Dynamax Pokemon may be using new models. It's not set in stone, or completely clarified, that's just what it seemed to imply. Considering that they don't use the money they make, yeah, right, nah, they totally had to make the Dynamax Pokemon be separate models. That's not confirmed, but a theory for sure. This is probably what they meant by we had to make Pokemon models from scratch, because the Dynamaxed ones are different models, and after all, that was the context of the interview. Dynamaxing is why the Pokedex cut happened. Dynamaxing probably uses new models. Though again, not 100% confirmed. It just happens to fit right in with the way they do things. Meaning perhaps every Pokemon in the game is there two or more times. Ugh, what if we're not even cutting Pokemon for better animations and it's more, we just don't know how to optimize a game, so we literally can't fit all the Pokemon in a single Switch cartridge because we have to have the Pokemon and then the Pokemon, but significantly larger as two separate models instead of just scaling them. Oh god, I hope that isn't the case. But it's not like they don't have a history of this. You may remember how originally Pokemon Gold and Silver wasn't going to have Kanto and all that stuff. But then Iwata came in and did some optimization programming to the point where they could fit all of it in. And they haven't learned since then. Could they be, perhaps, actively trying to be let go from the franchise? 
Are they trying to prioritize their other games like Town on purpose? The success of Pokemon Go and the likely success of Pokemon Masters and not to mention all the other spin-offs are all going great. Game Freak is starting to mean less and less to the Pokemon Company and Nintendo in every regard besides coming up with the <coughs> in every regard besides actually coming up with the Pokemon themselves. So is it possible then that my dream comes true? Will the Pokemon Company and Nintendo be able to buy up the last bit of ownership that Game Freak has over Pokemon and then get a new team willing to use a AAA budget, but also carry over most of the design team from Game Freak? Hmm. That would be nice. Though incredibly unlikely. Then again, maybe not. In two years, Pokemon Go made two billion dollars despite being made with significantly less effort, time, or money than traditional Pokemon games. It is incredibly low risk, high reward. And the only thing Pokemon Go didn't really experience well, as in capture the experience of well, was battling Pokemon, which is what Pokemon Masters is all about. Pokemon Go is already the most valuable Pokemon game right now. By a landslide. And when Masters comes out, it may wind up doing even greater. So what's the point of having Game Freak around anymore? Why even continue to develop more Pokemon? The money is in nostalgia and branding. Game Freak is at risk. And they probably know that. So they need to play it as safe as possible and make little innovations and gimmicks here and there. They said that themselves. Small innovations, nothing drastic. If they hurt the Pokemon brand in the eyes of the general public, that's bad news. So instead of looking forward and innovating, they constantly look back to what worked and build upon it lightly. It really sucks. Game Freak has been working hard on this franchise for decades. But two mobile games are outclassing all of that work in terms of monetization in a matter of years. Which may be why they're putting in more graphical work into town. It's their fail-safe plan if they can't do Pokemon anymore. A few interviews have hinted at this. So suddenly, I feel like... I feel kind of bad for Game Freak. All this hate and boycotting of Sword and Shield may be what does them in. Why invest in another mainline game that's just going to make the fan base mad when, for a fraction of the cost, you could make a mobile game, generate hundreds, if not billions of more dollars anyway. Is this what's going to do in the franchise? Unsatisfied folks boycotting the game, causing its hype and sales to die down, causing the main focus to shift even further away from traditional video games? Remember? Remember when we got spin-off after spin-off after spin-off? And now we get mobile game after mobile game update after mobile game after mobile game update. It's because they make way more money Heck, I wouldn't be surprised if the next console generation, the only reason they made a new mainline Pokemon game at all, is just to push the new system. Because Pokemon is a system seller. Even if the mobile games still make more money overall. And if the system gets sold, that's more likely for people to buy other games for the system, so it's a big circle of Nintendo money. Perhaps? Perhaps Game Freaks knows this. So? They don't bother making it the best that it can be. They don't bother raising the budget because they don't need to. The way they may see it, one of two things could happen. Either they get cast aside and the focus switches to mobile, or... Well... Or we're all still gonna buy the game anyway. So why try harder? If you can't tell by my tone, I've become disheartened. I mean, they really do have so, so much potential with the amount of money they make. But they just settle on being traditional. Even during a time when loads of other franchises are completely reinventing themselves. But that may be the way it has to be. So they may really be shifting focus to Town and their other games. But I mean, just look at Town. You can almost sort of tell that there was more care taken with it in terms of detailed shaders, grass textures, and monsters with expressions. Game Freak is falling behind. Uh, no, they've been behind. They introduced a rotating camera and plenty of Pokemon fans flipped 
These innovations are amazing. So what if this was a thing that video games had 30 years ago? Those other games weren't Pokemon. But the thing is, Pokemon has to be behind. It has to stay simple so that anyone can get into it if they're inexperienced. And the more experienced ones can have a bout of nostalgia with it because it's still the same as it used to be. And so, their game budgets still assume that we're in the late 90s. As does the core gameplay. Because that's what works. But it's not just those things that's letting me and others down. It's also just all the poo flinging going on in the Pokemon community. Plenty of people are just excited to have a new Pokemon game. And that's fine. But, of course, some people are pissed off by that alone. Like, really? Ultimately, nothing matters. And we're all gonna die anyway. Most of us probably alone. So, why spend your time fighting any and all comments of people legitimately happy just to shoot them down? Ugh. In summary, everybody is arguing with non-arguments that mean nothing and are filled to the brim with either misinformation or non-confirmed misinterpretations of information, though there are a few legitimate points being made on both sides, of course. I've been critical of Game Freak since X and Y, and this hasn't changed. Game Freak doesn't care to learn how to program efficiently, animate expressively, or budget. Or at the very least, keep the innovations and fun things in their previous games, because why would they? I'm gonna buy the game still anyway. Because Pokemon, despite its faults, is a f fantastic game. Even if it's not as good as it ideally could be, that doesn't make it bad. There's some level of truth versus ideals going on in this Sword and Shield debate. So, if you like Pokemon, play Pokemon Sword and Shield. They are the most graphically impressive mainline Pokemon games as of date, and also the mainline franchise may be at risk. But still, feel free to criticize it, even on its graphics, as most of the Pokemon still do look a bit... soulless. And if this dex cut is too much of a downgrade for you since you can't play as Finian, don't get it. And also feel free to criticize. Just don't be a jerk about it. Check your sources. And, again, don't be a jerk about it. Then maybe people will listen to you for once. Maybe then, too, the outside world won't think that the Pokemon fandom is a hateful fan base, but instead, a concerned one. So if you don't think you can be positive about it, or even, even positively boycott the game to express your discontent, then, like my innermost philosophy, shut up more often. You'll feel a lot better, misinformation won't be spread as much, and then you can more easily move along the grief tree and reach acceptance. Or, at the very least, be upset that people are upset less. Well then, I am ready for your comments and unsubscriptions. You see, I already bought the bleach!